Bobby and I said, hey, let's get a bass player and a drummer and start a real heavy rock group. Because disco had been battling rock and it was really tough, but now we had Clapton and Hendrix in one package. We sounded so much like each other. When we'd play back our jam sessions, we didn't know who was taking the solo. That's how close we were. So I called Ariel and Ty, and we met at Mars Studio. Had a hell of a first jam session. decided we were going to start the group. We practiced a few more times at Mars. Everybody was into their own thing, so we called the band the Drugged Mutants. Later we changed it to the Force for marketing purposes. And things were going really well with the band. We were sounding so good and we decided to book some studio time. Bobby knew Rick Danko from the band The Band, and Danko was the bass player. And right across the street from him was a guy named Dennis Dragon. Now Dennis's brother, Daryl Dragon, and Tony Tennille, the captain and Tennille, had the hit Love Will Keep Us Together at the time. So we booked an afternoon at Dennis Dragon's place. And he had a band called the Surf Punks that later cut an album. We had gotten a hold of some pharmaceutical cocaine before the session. So we were all like, wow. You know. We got in and we started on the first song. We played it for an hour. And we ended and we said, Dennis, how did that sound? We went to his control room. And he said, man, that was really great. Dennis said, if you guys want to record more than one song, you might want to recut that and make it a little shorter because you just used your entire 60 minutes of tape on that one song. So we said, wow, time went by fast, you know. We, <laughs> okay, let's try it again.
so we went out and we cut you know our eight or nine songs whatever it was and the tape came out really good uh and we had pulled in james wolf from the standells to sing one song in particular that bobby and i wrote and then ariel sang all of his songs we played some great songs when you're sixth in line who can remember names crank it's your hips crank it's your lips crank you can burn me down <laughs> just had a lot of great songs so we recut the tape and Bobby had connections at Wooden Nickel Records his sister was married to one of the chief executives there and they were a subsidiary of RCA he gave him the tape and the guy said look I see some potential but you guys need to write guitar harmonies and and restructure some of this stuff so we said okay we went back and we wrote harmony lines to maybe three of the solos uh, out of our dozen songs. We had arranged a great show. We were on a fantastic lineup at the Hollywood Palladium where they held the Grammys. This was going to be a big show. Well, Bobby had a wild girlfriend at the time. And he had moved down to Palm Springs. He would drive in on his Trans Am and would practice for a couple of days, go out to either the seafood broiler in Encino or to a Mexican restaurant downtown in Hollywood. And one day we were at our favorite Mexican restaurant. We had found a primo spot right on the corner. Parked the car, locked it, we're on the sidewalk and all of a sudden Farrah Fawcett pulled up in her teal green convertible that said Farrah on the license plate. And she said, hey boys, how about giving me your parking spot? You'd do that for me, wouldn't you? And we looked at each other and we said, nah, <laughs> we're hungry, we're going in. So we had a chance to score some points with Charlie's Angel, but it didn't matter. One day we were at my apartment on Kings Road and Bob would always bring his dog, Henry. Henry was a big Airedale and a very lovable dog. The apartment complex had a jacuzzi and after practice would always come back, Bob would roll up a huge joint, would go down to the jacuzzi and he'd bring Henry. One day we were high and laughing and he, you know, he, he, I don't know if Henry jumped in or Bob just brought him in. Um, and so there we are smoking this joint. Henry's in, in the jacuzzi and the apartment complex people walk in with a couple that they're showing the, the complex to poten potential renters. He opened the door and he saw us in there and he said, I, and he, uh, pool's closed for maintenance right now, but it's a really good jacuzzi. We could hear him say, walking out. <laughs> anyway, we had the greatest times. Uh, just Bobby and I hanging out together and listening to licks and writing songs. Well, he got in with this girl named Carol, who I uh, was a little older than him and a little bit more savvy. And I had a very cool concho belt. And the first time she met me, she looked at my belt and said, 
hey, that's a nice belt. Can I have it when you die? I said, no. And what makes you think I'm going to go before you? So one night, Bob and her had a terrible fight and she had locked him out of their house that they were renting in Palm Springs. So he punched the glass on the window so he could unlock the window and get it in. And there was like a guillotine up in the window. And as he reached his arm and to undo it, whoosh, that panel of glass came down. And it was actually his playing hand. No, it was his, his pick hand. And, and it sliced right down to the bone. So he was in the hospital. He wasn't going to be playing again for years. In fact, after he recovered, he, he reinvented a style where he could play with a thumb pick and move his arm up and down but he couldn't do his wrist anymore. So we had a big showcase booked at the Hollywood Palladium, as I was starting to say a minute ago. I think there were six bands on the lineup. Well, my friend Tony Carey had come back from Europe after recording with Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, and he was available. And so I said, hey, Tony, you want to do this showcase with us? And he said, yeah, sure. So we were playing, and during a song, the last song, Wild in the Streets. turned on the fog machine and the mist and Tony was going wild on the organ and some girl ran up onto the stage and she jumped on his organ and she threw her clothes off and uh, I, I had the pictures at one time the stage crew are carrying her off with just like a g-string on then Tony at the end of the song he dumped the Hammond over completely and we left in the fog and the we left the stage. Well, a friend of mine, Peter Glendeman, his band called Driver was coming up next. And the whole stage was soaking wet. They were getting shocked from touching the mic and everything. We left it that way. Peter Glendeman, I met on tour with Kathy McDonald and he was with a band called Goliath that opened up for us one time at the lion's share. And I had befriended him and turned him on to some contacts in LA. And I showed him a cool riff that I was working on. And he said, before the showcase, he said, hey, how, you know that riff you showed me? I said, yeah. He said, well, I kind of stole it from you. And that's our theme song called Driver. And I said, oh, that's nice. Enjoy the water. <laughs> so long. That was the last gig that the force ever played. But it's not the end of the story. While Bobby was recovering, Tony moved in with me and Terry out in Encino. 
the guy who lived across the street from me, well, across, the, you go up a flight of stairs, turn left is my apartment, turn right was Big John's apartment. This guy was like Big John Stud the Viking, okay? He was drinking Old English 800 quarts and he said, when I saw you hauling that furniture in across the courtyard at two in the morning, I knew this guy was on something. I said, that's just my Kung Fu power, brother. So we became friends and he told me that Robin Hilton of the Hilton Hotel chain, who was in the movie Blazing Saddles as Mel Brooks's large buxomed assistant, the redhead. So he said, yeah, I know Robin. And if you guys put on a showcase, I'll get her there and maybe she'll back you. I said, okay. So I don't know why, but I decided instead of me singing my songs, I would fly Ray down from San Francisco and have him sing my songs. Ariel played the bass, Ty played the drums, Tony on the organ, me on the guitar, and Raymond on occasional vocals. In this theater, and out in front of us was Big John the Viking and Robin Hilton. Well, we didn't get the, the backing that we were hoping for. And that was the last time the force ever played together. Now, two little caveats. One, a couple, maybe 10 years ago, a guy on Facebook came on and he said on Tony's page, he said, hey, Tony, there's an urban legend that there's a recording out there of you playing with Howie at the Hollywood Palladium. And he said, oh, it's just an urban legend. If you can find the tape, you got my permission to play it. Well, guess what, Tony? I found the tape. But actually, Tony, he was a genius. I mean, what a, he played cello as a kid. He could sing, he could play the piano, he could play bass, strum a rhythm guitar. And we recorded a couple of demos, one called The Next Time and another one called I Want a Natural Lady, which when I moved to Muscle Shoals, I pitched it to Clayton Ivey at Wishbone Studio and he almost recorded it. But in the end he said, no, nah, I'm looking for another boogie oogie oogie. So that was that story. Then the other caveat to the story was that the, my neighbor, Big John, he went, up to Hearst Castle in San Simeon. Google it if you've never seen it or heard about it. But William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper tycoon, had hundreds of acres and all of these wild animals. He had an outdoor swimming pool that was laced with gold and had busts of the Venus de Milo and Michelangelo and all. And the house was unbelievable, the fireplace eight people could stand in the fireplace. Well, John had a tuxedo on and he was drunk as hell and he was attending the tour and I had taken the tour so I knew what it was like. And they got to the pool and the guy said, now this was Mr. Hurst's exclusive pool where only the highest echelon in the world were allowed to swim in. And Big John goes, wow, and he <laughs> dove into the pool with his tuxedo on and was swimming around. And they couldn't get him out. He, might, he was too big. He didn't come out till he was ready to come out. Oh, that guy was a nut. But he was a cool guy and he tried to help out. And that's what this is all about, you know, just sharing one story at a time of the people that I meet on my journey through my 55 years in the music business. This is just another chapter in the book, my friends. I hope you enjoyed it. I appreciate you coming along with me. It really means a lot to me. If you would subscribe, it would make all the difference in the world. And if you liked and subscribed, man, give me the thumbs up and you are doing me a solid. Keep some love in your heart, my friends. Keep a song in your head. And I will see you on the next adventure of the old-time rock and roller. So long.